Hey everyone, welcome to the 235th episode of the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and your co-host, Kevin Tofel. And we have what is going to be a jam-packed show today for you that is going to have a lot of Amazon in it. I am heading out this morning. It's recording day, but it's also Madam A Day. Day. Amazon Day. So this show is going to be a little different. Kevin and I are going to do our news as normal, and then there's going to be an interview. It may be a surprise. The hope is Daniel Rausch, VP of Amazon Smart Home Division, at the event itself. But you can't promise these things. So I have a lovely backup option, and we'll still be talking about the Amazon event that is happening today. And by the time you hear this, it will be happening yesterday. I'm not the backup option, I hope. You are not the backup option. Okay, Kevin. good, 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 good. So what are we talking about today? As I mentioned, Amazon. But it also has news, including a show and tell feature that it's launched that Kevin has some opinions about, and a unified voice service that we're going to talk about this morning. Mm. Google has stepped up with some privacy steps for the home and its voice recognition efforts. But the Internet of Things is still a privacy dumpster fire on the Less consumer front, but still it will affect those. The Wireless Broadband Alliance is proposing that Wi-Fi and the LoRa protocols merge. We're going to explain what that would mean for maybe not everyone, but for a lot of different individuals. On the industrial side, I went to an industrial IoT event. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. And I've got some news about a startup that I've covered in the newsletter. We've also got a little bit on Fitbit being for sale, some news from Microsoft, and possibly more. We're also going to hear from our sponsor, Control4. And as I mentioned, our guest who is going to talk to us about Amazon's smart home efforts. Will it be Daniel Rausch, VP of Smart Home at Amazon? Or will it be our mystery backup provider? Stay tuned and you will find out. First, a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Hive MQ. As many of you know, MQTT has become the de facto standard for IoT. Hive MQ helps companies connect IoT devices to the cloud using MQTT. Companies such as Audi, BMW, Acer, and Sirius XM are using Hive MQ to build their IoT solutions. They rely upon Hive MQ to provide an MQTT platform that is reliable and can scale to meet the demands of millions of connected devices. You can find out more about HiveMQ at HiveMQ.com or check out their open source project on GitHub. All right. I'm excited. That was a protocol-related ad, and we're going to have a protocol-related discussion on the show. (laughs) Woo! Nerds unite! Just need some standards to talk about, too, and it would be awesome. We we kind of have those. Oh, Oh, yeah. All right. Let's talk about Amazon. We'll kick it off here. Show and tell. I should remind everyone, as we are recording this, we do not yet know what Amazon has launched. So we can't talk about any of this or any of that, rather. But we can talk about show and tell. Yeah, that's public because that was just announced. Yes. So this is a feature from Amazon's accessibility department where you can show Amazon Madam A, an object, ask her, what am I holding? And then voila, she will tell you. Except it's it's less of a voila and more of a voila. Because the process <laughs> does take a little bit of a time. It is It is not like, hey, Madam A, what am I holding? And she's like, oh, it's a banana. It appears to be fairly limited, but still really useful for people who are low vision or totally blind. What it does is it tells you to find the camera, which is going to be hard if you can't see, but there are audio clues to help you get there. And it looks like there's actually like a barcode scanner. There's a little light on the object. So you, sh- you hold the object up and then there's a sound cue that tells you to keep turning the object and then it'll beep and it'll tell you, hey, turn the object to the other side. And then Madam A is like, She'll either say, I think this is this type of product, or she'll say, I don't know what this is, but I did read the following words. So I held up a can of tomato sauce, or a jar of tomato sauce, rather. She got the brand wrong, 
but she did correctly identify it as tomato sauce. Hmm. So, so it's a win. It is. It's, it's a, I think it's a great accessibility feature for people, as you said, low vision or, or completely cannot see at all. I think it's phenomenal. And clearly they're using object recognition, uh, OCR, text recognition, et cetera. And it's interesting you actually have to turn the object around because with, I remember with the old Fire Phone, which was, came and went pretty quickly because it was it's not like successful. like a million years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And even in stores, when you scan objects using, say, the Amazon app, it's actually pretty quick and you don't have to like turn the, everything around. So I'm wondering what the difference is, why they're, why they need to take more time and, and various views of an object in this case. I can ask that later on today and we'll find out. Hmm. But I do think this is a pretty cool feature. Oh, the other thing, I held up a banana. It does not seem to recognize just random objects. It's hmm. the blog post did talk about pantry foods and that's where it definitely shown the brightest. I obviously have not spent my last two hours at home that I've been here <laughs> showing it foods, but it did an okay job. Like it couldn't recognize yeah. something, but it did know that it was, It said cream of tartar, which was a spice that I was holding up. I picked mm -hmm. something really random just to see what would happen. That's random. I don't have that in my house. I can tell you that. You're not making uh, pies. Lemon no. meringue pies. I uh, love lemon meringue pies, but I buy them. So This is really good for context awareness, would you say? Or is it still a little much work for context awareness, but we're, I feel like I can see the future. What about you? Well, yes and no. I mean, I, it has its place for sure. But, and it is early yet, but I worry, I worry, worry, worry about all the cameras in the homes and so on. And in addition to this news of Amazon adding new good features to the Echo Show devices with the camera, the information had put a story out this week that basically it was a very compelling argument that instead of controlling the screens in a home or a smart home, whoever or whatever ecosystem controls the cameras, that's the, the key for a smart home. And I kind of looked at what Amazon just did and what the information's thesis is, and that concerns me because I've been on a kick for presence detection. Who is in what room in my house so that my house has the context of maybe what I want to do right now or what I want to happen and so on. And I worry that cameras get looked at as the de facto standard for this actual personal recognition, not just detection, but recognition. And I think there are many other technologies that we should be looking at. In fact, we have, they just haven't taken off, such as GPS and geofencing, such as Bluetooth for presence detection, because a home could indirectly know that I am in a particular room in my house if, say, my phone, which is always on me, is in that room, right? Oh, yeah. So, and, and in fact, I know there's been issues with location, with, with Bluetooth and so on, but Bluetooth 5.1, the standard we talked about back in January, should bring centimeter level detection for location. So I worry that people are going to glom on too much to cameras, 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 not think about the privacy implications of, yes, the camera knows it's me in the room, but it also knows what I'm wearing. It knows what I'm doing, what I'm interacting with, what objects in the house I'm using, what are in, what's in my house. That, that may cross a line that we don't need to cross. I agree. We don't need to cross that line. And I will, sh I will do a shout out here. Is it a shout out? It might be just a call out. Room me actually looks like a really interesting and promising option here, but I still haven't gotten my review unit. So hmm. I can't wait to test that and see how I'm going to interact when it, it knows I'm in the room. Yeah. Um, I would also say not just using Bluetooth on your phone, but also just using Bluetooth like on my Fitbit device or on your Apple Watch for those of us who, you know, don't carry our phones everywhere. Okay, I said we'd speak about standards, and it looks like, I don't know, we might have one coming up, maybe? Amazon is pulling together a group of companies to create basically a, a unified voice standard? I don't know. Kevin, what is this? So the announcement that Amazon put out this week is that it's a voice interoperability initiative, which is a fancy way of saying all the partner companies have agreed to work together for simultaneous wake words on smart devices so that you can use whichever digital assistant you have installed and is supported on your devices. And I do not like that idea personally. Uh, we'll get to why in a little bit in the conversation, but it's worth noting that 
the partners in here, there's a lot of big names and I'm not going to go through all of them, but Ecobee is there, Microsoft is there, Salesforce, Sonos, Spotify, Tencent, and Verizon, for example. One is missing, <laughs> a big one, and that's big Google. Big <laughs> I said a big one. <laughs> <laughs> Google, Google Home. Yeah, Google Apple. is not here. Well, well Apple, yeah, but I wouldn't see Apple ever joining a group like okay. this. Yeah, I wouldn't either. But wouldn't it be no. cool if it did? It would be good, yeah. So simultaneous wake words. This is where I have a device and I can say Madam A or Hey G or I don't know how to say Cortana. Right? Cortana. So and then it would open the right one, correct? Yes, it would do whatever the, the correct digital assistant or the appropriate one would open up and do your bidding. Yes. There are devices that have multiple support, multiple assistant support, such as the Sonos One. Oh, but that's, uh, a, that's not as friendly. Remember, you have to pick well, one at the beginning. It's not simultaneous, right? You are correct. You configure it in the app to say, I'm going from this point forward, I'm going to use Google. If you want to change, you go back in the app and say, from this point forward, I want to use Amazon. But that's not why it's not friendly to me. And this is the issue that I have. I don't want to remember the names of multiple digital assistants to do different things oh. on the same device. So I think I'm going to disagree with you, Kevin. You do that. Go for it. So I saw this. Qualcomm actually was showing off this sort of capability, although being Qualcomm, it couldn't say that you know anyone was excited about this. It just was like, hey, we're doing it because we think it's neat. And this was probably two, maybe three years ago. And I love this idea because I currently have in my house two devices. I have the Google and the Amazon. And we have most of our smart home control through Amazon. But when we want to ask a question and get a decent answer, mm -hmm. we ask Google. Right. And it's not hard. We have trained ourselves to do it. I don't think this is going to launch the beginning of branded, like, hey, Ecobee, turn up my thermostat kind of things. That would be wrong. That would be terrible. Right. But I think I can hold two or three assistants in my mind, as it were. Because I think, like, Cortana may be awesome for integrating with my work, as mm -hmm. long as I don't have to say. And it actually might be something like, hey, Salesforce, do this. And that could be okay, too. Well, that's better than saying, hey, Madam A, ask Salesforce to do this. Yes. Exactly. I, I don't disagree with you there. I think my issue is it comes from a few bad experiences. And one of them, it was very recent. And we talked about this last week on the show, the new Facebook portal devices that were just announced and come out uh, next month. Also need to disclose, I did paid consulting for Facebook on that device. Uh, they wanted my impressions, basically. So I'm going to share one of my impressions right now. The fact that it has two digital assistants really irked me because you could say, hey, Portal or hey, Madam A to do something. There's some overlap, like Spotify, for example, when I would say, hey, Portal, shuffle this playlist on Spotify, all it would do is open up Spotify and then I would have to go and touch the screen. So instead, I'm like, well, then I'll just use the other one now because... Oh, you have to have the same features for each Bingo. implementation. Okay, that's fair. That's a good user interface takeaway. Yeah, because I there wouldn't want to know. I mean, I guess they got I, their money's worth then. <laughs> well, and I also talked to Ecobee's CEO Stuart Lombard yesterday because this was fascinating. And Ecobee makes a thermostat. The Ecobee Four has Madam A integrated into it, so it acts as an Amazon Echo device, basically. I don't believe play Spotify, but his company joined the group. He says that his existing hardware in the Ego before will actually support this. So it sounds like if you have the right hardware already in place in your devices, this could be something that could be a firmware update. So that's one. Mm -hmm. Two. That's good. He didn't sound like this was awesome because he was like, we're waiting on the other major voice assistants to see if they're going to join the initiative. He thinks this is early days in the whole smart home effort. He likes the idea that they won't have to force consumers to pick an ecosystem, especially because in his case, they're bolting it onto their wall, which is why they joined. But he also kind of agreed with me, Kevin, ha ha ha, that, he, <laughs> that as these digital assistants become more valuable and entwined in parts of our lives, we're going to have a digital assistant for our professional life and for our home life and maybe for 
whatever services, like in my case, I use Google a lot for email and whatnot. And he actually thinks that's pretty healthy because what that's doing is that's taking the digital assistant away from a device in a lot of ways and just putting it in the cloud. <laughs> I mean, it, it's letting you choose no matter what. And that that does seem like a good thing to do. But he doesn't think this is going to change the world tomorrow because, you know, the lack of Google, the lack of Apple, the lack of Bixby. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. So, Samsung is not on the list. And he calls it the second inning of the game change that is the voice assistant. Yeah. And, and the industry may go that way. And I'll just have to suck it up, I guess. I mean, I can always just use the one that I want to use regardless. So I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm not losing anything. I just worry about the end user experience. And, and there's opportunity to, to make that very good. So. Oh, yeah. I think it's important to note that. And I don't. Dang it, Kevin, we're disagreeing, but we're kind of agreeing about our points of disagreement. Yeah, that's true. All right. So speaking of voice, let's talk about Google's home privacy efforts. So all of the major voice assistants got in trouble for sending the snippets, your utterances, back to contractors. And the contractors came out and they're like, we could hear all kinds of crazy things going on back there. And the companies were kind of like, well, yeah, we do this for QA. What do you expect? And they were not quite that blasé about it since people were very upset. So Google has actually done some really good things. In an article at Wired, Google talks about how it is going to reduce the amount of audio data the company stores and for how long it stores it, which is really a big deal. Because, you know, it's one thing to train a model and test your voice record, like, is this working? And, oh, this isn't working and everyone has this problem. So let's use this data and train it. You don't have to keep everything for that. So I think that's really important. Absolutely. And really the, the control of what is used or what not used or stored really needs to reside at, at the end user level. And, and Google has improved your options there. You can uh, review your settings, you know, if you allow your snippets to be listened to by humans or and that I think was, you can that even... was actually always the case. And what they've also done is they've allowed you to take your sensitivity to background noise down, basically. Hmm. So maybe in your bedroom, you want Google to be a little hard of hearing, basically, is how I would think about it. So maybe right. you'll have to shout louder to tell it to turn off the lights. And I'm just going to throw this out here, Kevin. Hmm. This is kind of cool if you imagine Google joining any sort of voice interoperability standard, because you could actually very easily pick a voice assistant that protects your privacy. So as these companies mm. roll out different features, you might want to be like, oh, Madam A, you are super gossipy. I'm going to have to talk to G from now on. Just That's throwing that out there. Yeah, no, it's an excellent point. So anyway, by the end of this year, Google is going to update its Google Assistant policies on the reducing storage. Very soon, it is going to allow you to turn down the sensitivity. So that's actually really good. So I'm excited. I, I feel like, hey, attention to that issue, which I knew about. I mean, I, I guess sure. in the tech world, it's not so surprising, but I can see how that type of coverage would be like, oh. Yeah. I mean, all these issues were surfaced to the mainstream people that use these devices. We, we understand how to train and adjust machine learning, AI, et cetera. So I wasn't surprised either when I heard this was happening. And it was kind of like, yeah, well, how else are you going to learn? But surfacing this issue, um, calling attention to it on all the companies equally that have been found doing this, I think really raised awareness and forced these changes. Yeah. And that's, this is great. This is how it's supposed to work. The tech yes. people are like, yes. boom, we're doing this. And then people are like, wait, you're doing what? Let's, let's talk about that. And then they're like, oh, you don't like that, but that's how it works. And people are like, right. could it work some other way? <laughs> it's the, it's the, it's, I call it the engineering bubble, you know, nothing against engineers by any means, but you know, the engineers are great at solving problems. And sometimes the implications of the, those solutions aren't understood or experienced or thought about as an issue, right? Well, you know, if you ask somebody on the teams, they're like, well, of course we listen to these things, a small percentage. That's how we make it so good for you. But yeah, that's not the perspective that consumers have. Yes. But let us be real. There are still real issues. I will say that like yes. the, the business team might sometimes take advantage of that engineering mindset and 
pull out no. one and they, I know, it's shocking. No. So <laughs> <laughs> this is a study we actually, I think I included a link to it in the newsletter last week, but it's worth talking about, which is a joint collaboration between Northeastern University and the Imperial College of London, took a look at a bunch of smart devices and found, gosh. A mess. A mess. From a privacy perspective, anyway. This is a pretty extensive study, so it's probably worth resurfacing from the newsletter into the podcast, and, and again, putting a link in the show notes for those who want to read the study. It's pretty detailed in terms of what was tested, how things were tested. Perfect example, 34,586 experiments were done, and 72 of the 81 devices tested made contact with someone other than its manufacturer. And again, from a, that engineering mindset, you're like, well, of course. I mean, it's a, it's a smart TV. It's going to send what I watch to so-and-so, say, to Netflix and so on. They know. But the interesting thing is some of the TVs that were tested were never even set up with a Netflix account, and yet those TVs were pinging Netflix servers. Basically, maybe it's a sales lead. I have no idea. But it's a range of devices that were tested in the study, ranging from smart cameras, video doorbells, voice assistants on smart home devices. There were several false positives reported in that area. In particular, Amazon was noted for recording conversations, even though the wake word was not said. So, you know, yes, we know that happens, but this is really worth a good look if you're into knowing where these devices are sending data and such. And we talked about this with the the Firewaller review. Remember that a couple mm, yeah. about a month and ago? I guess the question I would have for people and what I think we need to start thinking about is you and I are nerds and we want this. Like, I love looking at information like this. I'm like, same. Yep. And, and we also have the ability to say AWS, oh, CloudFront, that's their CDN service. I'm not I'm not worried about that. That's just how you build web services. Right. But, right. you know, there's tons of companies in there. So building some sort of tool that lets a consumer look at this at the deep level, if they're like us and want to, but even a, I don't know if it's a red, green, a yellow, like, oh, hmm. check out this. This is fine. This is legit. Like who would, who would manage what's legit and what isn't? Because there are plenty of companies who are like, oh yeah, this is an ad tracking service. That's legit. And it is. But do you want your oven sending ad tracking service, uh, talking to an ad tracking service? Probably not. No, probably not. And, and I like the simple idea. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a lighting system. Maybe it's a dashboard that, that lets you know, Hey, there's data going out of the country that you reside in from your device. Like I saw a bunch of things going to, you know, China, uh, for a, you know, say a Chinese webcam. You would expect that to a point. If you bought a U.S.-based one and it was sending things to China, you would not expect that, and you may want to know that. And I'm not trying to single China out. It could be any country that the data is going to. But something that just says, hey, your device is talking to another company that's in another country. Do you want to know that? Your device is sending 50 gigabits of data to the Ukraine? <laughs> I'm a little concerned about this. Mm, me too. All right. So I would love to see that. If you're building that, give us a call. Tell us about it and what the the struggles and such are. Another big story this week, the Wireless Broadband Alliance threw out this paper that kind of blew my mind. They suggested that maybe it's time for Wi-Fi, the protocol we know and love, and LoRaWAN, which is a another protocol for sending small amounts of data over long distances, maybe Wi-Fi and LoRaWAN should merge. And I saw this and I was like, what? Crazy. And then I skimmed through the 69-page paper accompanying <laughs> this, which is very technical. It's actually a really good paper talking about why this makes sense and how it could happen from a radio and everything perspective. I'm going to summarize this because otherwise we'd be here all day. Wi-Fi. It's everywhere. People love it. It is high data rates. You can go, you know, you can send your video camera data, you can send your TV data, all of that. But it doesn't go very far. That's one problem with Wi-Fi. And the other is that it's very battery intensive. So that's why we don't see a lot of Wi-Fi sensors. All right. LoRaWAN. It is very little bits of data and it can go up to a kilometer and you can set these networks up in a practical way. There's not that many huge LoRaWAN networks. It's not like a mobile or a cellular network. And this is the business argument here behind this, which is right now the cell companies are pushing cellular technologies for IoT, long-distance, low-power IoT. 
And there's other companies like Sigfox and everybody else pushing their own standards here as well. This is not bad, but it's really tough if you are a company trying to figure out, ah, what do I want to put in my sensor that's going to be in the field for 10 years? On the cellular side, there's some some business worries. One is the cellular guys are really focused right now on 5G, and they're investing a lot in this. In the U.S., they also happen to have bet on the wrong IoT technology. They bet on LTE Cat M as opposed to NB-IoT, which is the lower data rate, lower power standard. Somehow we always screw up these choices. Yeah, don't get me started on the U.S. cellular okay. companies. Mm-hmm. We're not going there. CDMA for the win. Woo! All right. That was just techno babble for anyone who doesn't understand that. But if you do, <laughs> you're like, oh, I know. So the cellular companies, they're like, are they going to roll out 5G, NB-IoT? All is, ah, ah. So that's, that's a little iffy. They are rolling this out. But... It's also kind of a pain to deal with them. And a large part of the reason is, it, is it's a pain is these are all licensed frequencies that they use, whereas Wi-Fi is unlicensed, and, and so is LoRaWAN. So business cases, they're like, hey, everybody's got Wi-Fi. If we integrated LoRaWAN onto, like, with a Wi-Fi radio, and we did some technical magic, and I'll explain it, to make it not consume as much power, you would have the ability to do long distance radio that's low data rates, and you would have high data rates. So you could have like a Wi-Fi LoRaWAN sensor, and it wouldn't suck a lot of juice, which sounds kind of cool, right? And then you could even you read that sensor like from half a mile away. Right, which is ideal for IoT type devices. So can we do it? My gosh, we can. Yes, we can. (laughs) (laughs) So the paper goes into this there, and I'm not going to go into all of this, but essentially what would happen is you would have the low power LoRaWAN radio and a Wi-Fi radio on the same chip. And if needed, the LoRaWAN radio would wake up the Wi-Fi radio when it's like, oh, this is way more data than I can handle. And there would be some gateways. We'd need some software to like handle all of that. We'd actually need chip vendors. One of the things I'm curious about is Laura is actually a company called Senate makes Laura chips and other people can make it, but make them, but I don't know that anyone really is. And that's kind of a, yeah, uh, a worry. Is it? A, yeah. I'm like, is it a worry? Is it a, I don't know, but When I talk to people who are deploying IoT-focused networks, they really focus on being protocol agnostic as much as they can. And I'm talking about things Mm -hmm. like service providers. So companies that are really just trying to be a network provider for IoT as opposed to companies with a a dog in this hunt, as it were, like a Sigfox or an Mm AT&T. So I don't know. I reached out to the Wi-Fi Alliance to see what they said, and I have not heard back from them. But... We'll keep on this because this is one of those stories that I'm fascinated by. Yeah. Well, that's it on the nerdy protocol stuff. Let's talk about Fitbit. It appears, according to Reuters, that Fitbit is trying, it's struggling, and it is having discussions with investment banks about whether it should try to put itself up for sale. And that makes me sad because I love Fitbit. It has not actually decided to pursue a sale, and it may not. But it is talking to bankers. So the funny thing is the analyst firm that they're working with or the investment bank is trying to get them or suggesting that Alphabet, Google's owner, could buy it. And I don't see that happening. I don't know why you would try and get into the fitness and smartwatch sector with Google because they really are not a player. Oddly, the Versa 2, the Fitbit that just came out, does have Madam A built in, although you do have to have your phone nearby because there's no cellular connection to use Madam A. And it sure makes sense to me that it would be an Amazon that would buy Fitbit. Oh, that's an interesting thought. I thought it'd be kind of fun if one of the the chip vendors whose stuff was in the Fitbit bought mm-hmm. it and decided to become their own hardware play. That'd be kind of fun. There's just too many watches and wearables in this space. It is. It's too much. I would not want to be a new one or take Fitbit to my company and try to grow the market. I would say, let's take the market that they have and 
um, see what kind of data we can get like, from and it. suck the data from and it. And suck the data dry. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, Amazon's not in the wearable space. No, so, that's true. And I'm yeah. sure they would love some of that data. All right, well, well, we'll see what happens. Maybe Fitbit will just keep muddling on. A company I just want to mention because I profiled it a couple weeks ago. I profiled it as Light App. Um, it is a Tel Aviv startup that has built a energy, well, it's an industrial IoT software service and sensors, so hardware as well. And it basically optimizes your plant for you. And they have rebranded, launched as a company called Zira, Z-I-R-A. This is pretty cool. And I'm so excited about this company. I think what it does is really nice. Basically, you bring them in. They look at your stuff. They throw all these sensors on there. You can subscribe to their service. They actually have built ties in with like your maintenance companies and vendors, third-party vendors of the equipment. And those guys can buy this software as well. So they've brought network effects into this. But a company using their software in California, so Bimbo Bakery's California plant, they saw a 47% efficiency improvement it brought them savings of $160,000. And this was actually just on making their compressed air generation more efficient. On average, they were part of this big project in California. The companies who use this software, again, just on compressed air generation, saw a 23% reduction in total energy consumption. And this is part of a whole new wave we're going to start seeing when we have this type of data we can start optimizing the same way like the data center companies because energy is their largest cost in a lot of ways and a huge limiter for them, energy consumption. We're actually going to be able to see this across factories all over the place. For the most part, energy consumption has been seen as pretty fixed in a factory. Same thing with water consumption. These things are just fixed things that you just need. But when we start adding sensors, we can actually say, oh, I could cut this by a lot. And you'll see savings and you'll see resource reduction, like conservation. So I'm excited about this. Let's see. What else do we have? Anything else we should talk about? I don't think so. I think we got a voicemail question. Oh, it is time for the IoT Podcast Listener Hotline. All right. The hotline is brought to you by Schlage. Schlage's wide variety of smart locks lets you create the smart home of your dreams. Learn more about Schlage's smart home solutions and compatibility with Amazon, Apple, and Google products at schlage.com slash IoT. So go there, check that out. Thank them for sponsoring the IoT Podcast Hotline and for providing a Schlage lock to win. So if you call us and leave a voicemail, you will be entered to win this month's prize, which is a Schlage lock. Woo! They're very nice. All you have to do to be entered to win is to call us at 512-623-7424. And voila, you will be in there. So this week, we have a really good question because it's actually one that I've been pondering myself. So <laughs> let's hear it. Hi, Stacey and Kevin. This is Jason from Brantford, Ontario, Canada. I want a button by my bed to turn the bed lights on and off. I've heard you talk about the trod-free lights before, and I'm interested, but I'm worried about getting locked into that ecosystem if I eventually want the button to do more, say turn off lights other places in the house or lock my front door. I was wondering if you could give me some direction or suggestions on other ways to go. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay, Jason. Man, you are good. You are right. I did have the trod-free lights by my bedside table or on my bedside table and with my husband's bedside table. I know you're worried about lock-in. And you should be. And you should be. But I'm just going to throw this out there. The trot-free stuff is relatively inexpensive. For $70, you're going to get three lights, the gateway and the little dot puck remote control. The button. Thing. The button. Thank you. I was like, yes. mm -hmm. words. So this is not a terrible deal. I mean, it's so you won't feel bad if you only use it for a small amount of time or two years or so. The implementation with Google is the reason I uninstalled it, or maybe it was Madam A, but all of that is fixed now. It works. And I liked it because sometimes you don't want to talk to your lights. You just want to push the button. 
The downside, and you can actually buy a second button for $16. So on one side for me, I could have one. And then on the other side for my husband, I could have one. And that, that button has actually multiple buttons on it, really. It does. The challenge I had with the buttons and the IKEA system was it can dim them and it can change the color warmth, so warm to cool lights. What it couldn't do, you grouped them. So when I grouped them, I could only turn them off. So if I wanted to turn my light off, that was great. Or, But if I wanted to turn both our lights off, I had to resort to a different mechanism. So... Mm. Not very flexible, and since and it only works with the trot free system as well. Right, but it is so easy and it's kind of neat. So if you only have your room and your light, it'd be fine. My- yeah, but you're not going to be able to repurpose it as you had wanted. Right. So yeah, the other option that I'm going to recommend that is very flexible, although it will require more gear, as is the case. Of course it will. But it's a good place to start. Is the Lutron Caseta Wireless Smart Lighting Dimmer Kit. And what this is going to do is this gives you, it's a lamp module. So you plug it into your outlet and then you plug the lamp into the lamp module. And then you suddenly have Lutron style controls to that lamp, whatever's plugged into it. That's a dimming. It's not going to do color stuff, but it will dim it up and down and turn it on and off. That lamp kit also includes a Pico remote. And the remote is what you're going to put by your bed and you will use that to control the lamp. So that will work for the lights. But if Jason wants to later lock his front door... He's going to have to buy the Lutron Bridge. Yeah. But the Lutron Bridge is one of the best and most flexible platforms out there. I love it. It is kind of expensive. It's like 80 bucks, but it works with Amazon. It works with Google and it works with HomeKit. Right. And there are other options that would be, I'll call them more universal. Each one of these would also require some bridge or hub. You can get a uh, Samsung SmartThings button for about 15 bucks. It's a Zigbee button. And yes, you could use it for your lights or you could then later use it for your door. In fact, it supports multiple presses. uh, So you can do a double press or a long press. So that could control your lights with a single press and lock your door with a double press and so on and so forth. Again, though, you'd need a smart things hub. And if you're going to have a hub, you could certainly choose a different button, such as the Fabaro Z-Wave button, but that's about $50. That's a it's a nice looking button, but yeah, it is, it is uh, pricey. And we've previously mentioned the AOTech Nanomote button, which also has four separate button presses on it. It's a Z-Wave device. Again, you'll need a hub for that because... That's not going to work over Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. That one is $45. If you're just in the market for a flexi button, I'm going to recommend the Flick button. The downside is it's Bluetooth only and it connects via your phone. So what you're going to be dealing with in that case is you get this button and you program it via the app to work with your light, for example. And as long as your light or whatever your light's plugged into is online. So if you have like a Wemo outlet or that Lutron outlet, you can tie it to something like Ift or another, like you know me or something like that. Then you can take the flick button, you program it, the Bluetooth signal from the flick says, I have been pressed. (laughs) And it tells your phone and then your phone tells whatever other software it needs to tell, the button has been pressed. Go tell the light to turn off and it will happen. Right. So lots of options. If the trod free is, I think is fine. Just if you just want to do the lights, if you don't want to just do lights though, you're going to have to go with one of the other things that we suggested. Yeah. Then you're looking at like a smart home platform. If you're going to do that, I'm going to recommend you go with the most flexible, which is probably going to be like a smart things since we can't, yep, I would agree <laughs> since we can't recommend wink or it's difficult to, yes, you could look at, and I should say the flick does now have a gateway device that you can plug in. So you don't need your phone, but that's like a hundred bucks. And I'm, yeah. I'm not going to recommend that. That's too much. Anyway. So lots of options. We may have confused you more. We are not trying to do that, but the point is you can do this a lot of different ways at different price points and, I'm going to say the least complicated is probably the Lutron, and that's going to work forever, but it's only going to be mm-hmm. light specific. Right. And it's kind of expensive, but not crazy. <laughs> it's actually cheaper than Ikea. Whoa! Okay. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> it's crazy. I haven't had my coffee. All right. That concludes this portion of the show. So stay tuned for our guest this week, Daniel 
Roush, VP of Smart Home Services at Amazon. But first, a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Control 4. Hey everyone, we are taking a quick break from the Internet of Things podcast for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Control 4, makers of the Smart Home OS. And I have Brad Hintzy here to talk to us from Control 4. So Brad, customers have a few choices when automating their homes. What sets Control 4 and its Smart Home OS apart from other smart home companies? As a smart home OS, Control 4 brings all of those connected devices that you're bringing into your home together into one platform, and it makes it a part of the infrastructure of your home so that you know it's always running, it's easy enough for the whole family to use, and there's a pro right around the corner to help you out to make sure it's installed properly, that you're safe and secure, and they're there to help you so that you don't have to mess with any of the settings or configurations as your home evolves and you bring in new and additional devices. All right, so you mentioned the Smart Home OS. What exactly is that? A Smart Home OS, like the OS on your mobile phone that brings all of these individual technology pieces together so that you get really great experiences, the Smart Home OS does the same thing for your home. When you're orchestrating your lighting and your entertainment or your security system so they all work together, you get so much more value out of having a smart home, such as when somebody comes to your front door and you're out and about, you get that call on your mobile phone, you see who it is, and then you can do something about it. Unlock the door, turn on the lights, and some people even like to turn on the sprinklers to get whoever's on their porch off of their porch because they're not home. But you can only do that when you have an OS that brings all of that technology together and orchestrates it for you to live smarter in your home. Got it. So we've been talking about your smart home OS, and that sounds awesome. And I know that Control 4 has done a lot to help consumers like me bring in existing smart home devices, but I can't help but worry that this is too expensive for a normal individual. There was a time when home automation really was for the ultra wealthy. But over the last several years, we have been bringing this technology to more and more households. If you pay a landscaper to work on your yard, if you lean on professionals for many other aspects of your home, then a home automation system from Control 4 is likely within your budget and something that you could easily do as well. Okay. Well, this sounds great. So if someone is interested in learning more about Control 4, where should they go? The best way to learn about Control 4 is in a Control 4 certified showroom. There's over 200 around the world. That's where you can go meet a pro, see the technology, and play with it um, and get really hands-on. To find a Control 4 certified showroom, go to control4.com. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham. And today's guest is Daniel Rausch, who is VP of Smart Home at Amazon. Hi, Daniel. How are you? Hey, Stacey. Great to be here. This is so weird for me, you guys, because I am in a professional studio facing the person I'm interviewing. <laughs> I don't even know what to do. The sound is coming across feet of open air. That's Amazing. right, instead of miles. <laughs> so we are here at the Amazon, I believe it's the Alexa and Device Services event. They just launched more than 80 pieces of news. That's right. They just threw this at us. So we're going to talk about the big overview of what we heard from Amazon's perspective. So let me ask you, just easy peasy, mm -hmm. what were you most excited about today going in? Well, I think going in, you know, you saw Dave today talk about our big three themes in the smart home specifically. We want the smart home to be simple. We want it to be really smart and getting smarter, and we want it to be safe and help make customers safer. So those are our big themes within the smart homes specifically. I'm sure we'll get to talk about each of them, but a few highlights from today in each bucket. You know, we talked about how our smart home selection has grown to over 85,000 products that can integrate with Alexa. By the way, we started the year at just 30,000, and 30,000 was up from the year before 4,000. So it's huge nonlinear growth in smart home selection for customers. And to be clear, those are physical products products, yes. not just skills. That's right. Those are physical products that customers can connect to Alexa and get more out of through that connection. So they can talk to a water sprinkler in their front yard or to their lights or to their smart home cameras. So there's this huge amount of selection. 
Of course, that brings complexity for customers, so we also want to make it simpler. So we started this new program today called Certified for Humans. And the sort of pithy, you know, peculiar name implies that the only prerequisite for smart homes should be that you're a human being. You should be able to set it up simply. Of course, packed behind that program is a ton of technology for developers. You'd see in our developer blog post today that we opened up our frustration-free setup initiative to any developer that wants to integrate. So you can benefit from this really easy Wi-Fi setup experience, Zigbee device setup experience, and we announced that we're coming soon with Bluetooth protocol as well. So we're really excited about the technology that backs that program and the program itself for customers. That's sort of the first bucket of simple. In the smart bucket, you know, we're working on machine learning features like Alexa hunches. Uh, these are proactive features that reach out and sort of help customers navigate this complex smart home, making it dead simple. So if you forget to lock your lock at night, this is a great example. You set your alarm with Alexa. She might say, got it, Stacy. But by the way, you forgot to... Lock your front do door. Do you want to lock, lock your it? front door? Right. And you'd say, of course I do. So that's a good example of ways we're making it smarter. The difference with hunches now, because we're going to talk about this a little bit, yeah. is it used to be a little bit proactive like a step. Now mm -hmm. we're talking about bringing in a full routine. And that's right. Also, it can proactively notify you. But is that coming from the smart device, those notifications? Or is it coming from my history of purchasing things on Amazon? It's basically, you know, what one of the benefits for customers of the smart home is that the state awareness is there. So you can check to see if your lock is locked. You can check to see if your lights are on or off. You can check to see, you know, if your security system is armed, right? There's a lot of benefits to the, that statefulness of smart home is how we would think about it as developers. And we're able to learn the states that a customer wants at a given time through machine learning and then feed back to them when we see anomalies. So it's really a sophisticated anomaly detector that we feed back anomalies to customers that they might want to make a choice about. Forgot to lock your door. Forgot to turn on the porch light, which we actually know you want on overnight because you normally turn on your porch light. So it's, it's things like that where we've detected an anomaly. And that is now available to all customers everywhere. I'm not even done with the three buckets. That was our I middle know. bucket of smarts. Last bucket is safe. And so we talked a little bit about guard today. We extended that to human activity detection. We know that customers love enabling Alexa Guard and connecting it to their security system as well, actually. Uh, we talked about Sidewalk. I know, No doubt you're going to have questions for me about Amazon Sidewalk and extending IoT beyond the edge of the home. So those are some of the ways that we're going to serve that safer bucket as well. So looking back at the announcement, for me, there were actually many, many announcements about smart home and how we're going to I think get it through this phase where it's going to become completely ubiquitous. We're sort of past the initial phases where we've proven out that voice is the critical change for smart home for simplicity, and now we're into truly mass adoption. Okay. That was a lot. That <laughs> now you guys know how I felt when I was sitting there times, <laughs> let's say, 120. Yeah. Okay. So thematically, what I'm taking away from the day so far is if last year was all about helping people get on to the smart home a little bit easier mm -hmm. and making it more accessible for developers with uh, Alexa Connect Kit, and I always want to say frustration-free Wi-Fi setup, but that mm -hmm. is not the name. This year, it is all about living with the technology and continuing to build out the infrastructure we need to make this accessible to people. And as you said, I'll give you safe, although... I'm not 100% sure on all of that. So with that in mind, when I see this, I think of Alexa as the new platform for computing. I don't mm -hmm. think of a digital speaker in the Echo devices. I think of Alexa. And so talk to me about when you divorce Alexa from a smart home device, how do you see that going forward? What is your big picture here? Or maybe it's just the big picture for the next year. If I'm, if I'm taking your meaning right, I think of Alexa as connective tissue. It's sort of a fabric in the home. It is, on a technical level, a backplane for making and receiving state operations and delivering instructions to devices. And there's all kinds of technical things that we can externalize and make available to developers that really help Alexa be a platform for connectivity in the home. For customers, obviously, it's a great it started as a great voice interface. So you could do very simple things in an even simpler way. Mm -hmm. That was sort of how we started. But it turns out that's delightful. It's great to be able to use your voice to interact with your lights or you know, use an Echo Show to stream your smart home camera from the front door to the kitchen when your hands are full and you're cooking dinner. All, those are delightful use cases in a voice-directed way. We're sort of evolving beyond the most sophisticated remote control for your home. And I think the next phase is 
is really delivering what I would call an actually smart home. When you have features like hunches detecting anomalies and delivering a new live with smart home feature, to use your own words, to customers, making it truly simple and elegant, it so far exceeds the value of the analog world that preceded it. It's not just simpler to interact with. It's that those capabilities weren't available before at all. You could use a light switch, of course, an analog light switch to turn on and off your lights. You just get up and go across the room. Now we're moving into a phase where it's just there was no one around to remind you to lock your door or keep your home safe by turning on your lights outside. Now Alexa's there. Okay. And with that in mind, what kind of infrastructure are we going to start to need for this? Because like with hunches, the proactive hunches, for example, what kind of infrastructure do you need, not just to the hardware, but to the outside world and services that you guys can pull from, that I can choose? How is that going to work? Well, I think so. There are definitely some tenets behind how that works that are really important to us. So just to talk about how we treat the data and how important it is to keep it in customer's control and transparent to them. The Alexa Privacy Hub makes available control over a customer's smart home data so you can actually manage it. You could delete all your smart home data that Alexa has access to, for example. And we take very seriously the idea that it needs to be transparent and in a customer's control. I think the from a technical level, what we want to do is make more available to to Alexa as a platform and then externalize more capabilities to developers. So take something like Alexa Guard. There we've said, okay, we can actually take Echo devices and add them as sensors to your existing security system from Ring, of course, or even third-party companies like ADT. So by working with them, they add Alexa control to their system. We deliver back the value of adding a new sensor to their system and sort of add to their platform. So I think you know, the interoperation among systems is going to be really important to customers, and the emission of data and harvesting that in features is going to be really important. And of course, behind all of that, maintaining transparency and control. And you guys actually launched some subscription services. There's the Food Network thing. There's getting Samuel L. Jackson on my Echo for 99 cents. Mm -hmm. That kind of brings this bigger question is, how do you make money on this? Because a lot of companies are charging or thinking about charging for access to some of this stuff. I don't see that from y'all yet, but obviously people are like, if they don't make money off of it, they're just using my data and selling it to the highest bidder. So how does that work? What yeah, are the how economics should, How there? should customers think about it? Yeah. Well, I think sometimes people are surprised by the reality of this statement, but it is truly the way we run the company. We work backwards from customers. We let the business take care of itself. We know that if we solve hard problems for customers, the rest will take care of itself. You also know, and you're familiar with our strategy in hardware, which is not to make money when we sell a customer a piece of hardware. It's to better our relationship with that customer, and we'll figure out over time how in line with customers' interests, we also can have a healthy business. And so we're following that approach with Alexa. This is a huge opportunity. What voice can do as an interface for customers and what artificial intelligence can do as a set of capabilities beyond that is just astounding. So I think- Assistant's going to be bigger than like the mobile phone platform. It's bigger than the internet in some ways. I definitely know. believe that it will be, right? Because of how much that customers can get out of simple interactions mm -hmm. and the huge amount of sort of ask you can devolve to an artificial intelligence and get a return on. So I think there's a lot there for customers, and we're willing to basically make a very big bet. So you, do, you will see us experiment with things like you can add Samuel L. Jackson's voice to Alexa for 99 cents. So we'll keep experimenting and see what customers want from us with Alexa, but you'll also see us just, frankly, inventing because we think the possibilities are so endless. Okay. Let's move into the slightly narrower picture here and just ask you about a couple things that yeah. happened at the event. David Lemp referred to these day one edition products, and these two were the frames, which are eyeglass frames with Madame A embedded in them, and then a ring that also had Alexa inside. And he mentioned the idea of these solving problems that are far out there and thinking about that. Can you talk about the opportunities that you see that created those two products? What's the thinking there? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you, you know, I've been using them and I'm a passionate believer in both of those products. It might not be obvious at first, but what I find intriguing about them most is how different they are from my phone. My phone has a huge amount of capabilities. I, I'm super glad that I carry one in my pocket and with me everywhere. There's much that I get done with it. It also separates me from the world around me. When I pull out my phone, I am disconnected from my environment. I even have rules in my home about how I use my phone around my family and kids because I actually, it creates a disconnection. 
I find, and I've used frames longer than, than loop, I have found my experience with frames in particular that I'm not disconnected from the world around me and I still have access to the power of Alexa. So frankly, with smart home, it's a little bit like having the force because you can quietly talk to yourself and control the environment around you, <laughs> turning sure. on your lights or unlocking a door or, and there's a magical moment in the frames video where, you know, a dad has his daughter on his shoulders and he comes out for her birthday party and he turns on the party lights and it's just powerful. So I think still being in the world around you, but having access to Alexa and all the power that comes with that is really what I take away from those products. That was the reason I actually purchased in the invite only back in December of four years ago, five mm, years ago. Yeah, That's why I bought an Echo because I hated having the phone around my house. I'm with you. Let's talk about Sidewalk because, oh my gosh, you guys, it's a wireless protocol. So <laughs> this is a wireless protocol. It's low bandwidth. It's 900 megahertz spectrum. So that's the same thing your microwave, your baby monitors, some garage door openers run on this. It's unlicensed. And you should tell us why it came about. Yeah. I think the, you know, when we when, as we're pushing to the edge of the home, basically, we're finding that we're just limited in the use cases we can deliver to customers. And and customers really want them. So Mailbox sensor. Exactly. So you've got your phone and it's BLE tethering we're all familiar with. And we get a lot of functionality. And, and we just launched some, right? Frames that tether to your phone. The, the new Echo Pods do. Echo Loop tethers to your phone. So all of that capability is delivered through your phone. But of course, Bluetooth is limited. It's, you know, it's measured in feet, not in meters or yards. Then you get Wi-Fi and you can get great Wi-Fi connectivity throughout your home pervasively. You can set it up easily, but it doesn't go beyond the home very well. You get down into the yard, you sort of move into the cellular domain. So we definitely believe in the future of 5G. Even 4G connectivity is pretty great, but frankly, it's complex. It's yeah, expensive. Yeah, I'm going to laugh at you on 5G. I'm thinking more like NBIOT. <laughs> you don't need 5G for your yard. Right. You okay. don't need it for your yard. So, but, so there's this huge middle ground of use cases we want to be able to cover and that, frankly, developers want to be able to cover, but it's really hard today. It's very low bandwidth. It's battery power that you want years of battery power, not hours or days of battery power, and you're willing, the data transmission does not have to be that high. These are small packet, small transmission uh, loads. So we uh, invented Amazon Sidewalk, and we're excited to bring that to developers. What we showed in our presentation today is that by using 900 megahertz, you know, with distances you can measure in half miles from a single hub, you can cover incredibly large swaths of terrain with very few nodes. And it looks like, based on, the, they gave an example in a reference design for a dog collar tracker. Or That's right. Dog Fetch. collar. Thing. Fetch. That implies that this is going to be a mesh system. And it also, they also mentioned security a lot. And at 900 megahertz, because it's so common, this is exactly the issue where, you know, you'd have truckers tuning into your baby monitor. So I'm assuming, along with this protocol, the security we're talking about is to prevent other people from listening in. That's right. It's basically, you know, it's a very widely used spectrum, so you have to build this protocol in, a, in an incredibly secure way with encrypted transmission and all kinds of other things that I won't go into details on, but we have a very high security bar for Amazon Sidewalk. What we really want is that ubiquity of coverage. So, you know, we covered most of the LA Basin with 700 nodes, and those were literally just beta customers from okay, Ring. Okay, those were customers. So I will become internal, part of this network. Internal beta customers of Ring. We're using an unexternalized version to do uh, Ring sidewalk lighting today, which is already outside the home, meaning you in your own home would use your 900 megahertz chip that's in your hub that communicates with your lights, right? And so that's the, that's the use case that's existing today. What we want to do is open that up to create a network of that 900 megahertz availability across neighborhoods and cities. And for all my chip heads out there, this means I could grab a 900 megahertz radio. Mm -hmm. I could put your protocol that I assume will be on GitHub sometime? Next year. Next year. So I grab that protocol, I run that, and then I can have products that, is there going to be a certification effort? Yeah, there'll be an SDK. Okay. I'm not clear, frankly, exactly where we will end up on the certification requirements, but no doubt, like any program where you're keeping it secure, there's going to be a whole set of requirements that go with it. And then you'll be able to build products that take advantage of that network. Okay. Y'all, there was so much happening. I feel like I don't, <laughs> I can't cover it all. We can't talk about it all. So the last thing I want to ask you 
is what do you think the biggest problem remaining to be solved in the smart home? And I'm not talking about your announcements here today. What is it? I'm going to vote presence detection, but I want to hear what you think is the biggest, like, ah. I would, I would put presence detection in the class of problems that I also think is the sort of next phase, which is, it's a little bit what I said before, extending beyond the sophisticated remote control. I think what customers really want is from a control perspective, their home should just dissolve into the background. <laughs> you actually want your home to just do things on your behalf. The smartest home will be one you don't notice, but that just works and hums for you. It'll know when people come and go. It can tell you if you want to know that. It can suppress that information if you don't want to. It will adjust your environment to your needs without needing to be asked, etc. That's on a baseline control level. But you should also be able to get all kinds of value from your smart home and by connecting your products that that you wouldn't be able to even dream of in the analog world. So I would put, sure, presence detection and the signal around things like someone's home, someone's not home, and individual Stacy's home versus somebody else's home versus the whole family's home. I think that that's a subset of the kind of signal that the smart home needs in order to create this truly delightful world where the home is taking care of you on your behalf. Okay. I said that was the last question. This is really the last question. <laughs> How far off do you think we are from that vision? Well, I mean, smart home is growing non-linearly, and I expect our pace of innovation to do the same. So I think the sky's the limit. I think we'll get to that truly proactive, truly collaborative home where it's taking care of you on your behalf. How far out is it? I don't think it's measured in decades. I think the interest is there. It might be measured in years or months, not decades. Months. All right. Wow. I better get busy, you guys. All right. Thank <laughs> you so much for coming on the show today, Daniel. Stacey, it's always great to talk to you. Thanks so much. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, if you'd like more IoT news, sign up for my newsletter at stacyoniot.com. We'll see you next week. 